Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Eugene Cho, a tobacco control researcher at the University of South Carolina. TOPS is organized by Catherine McLean from Temple University, Mike Pascal from Georgia State University, Xi Sheng from The Ohio State University, and Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Xi Sheng from OSU to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Today, we continue our winter 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Bo Fong entitled Effect of E-Cigarette Taxes on Prenatal Smoking and Birth Outcomes. Dr. Fong is an economist in the health division at American Institutes for, for Research, AIR. His recent work has focused on the application of modern empirical methodology to evaluating the impact of federal and state regulatory changes and care delivery reforms on quality, cost, and patient outcomes, as well as developing policy-relevant publications. His research has appeared in Health Economics, American Journal of Health Economics, Health Affairs, Small Business Economics, Journal of Mental Health Policy and Economics, and Annals of the American Association of Geographers. His work is also featured in media outlets, such as Forbes and Market Watch. Dr. Dr. Rahi Abak from William Patterson University and Dr. Michael Pascal from Georgia State University are co-authors of the study and will answer Q&As. Our discussion today is Dr. Justin White, Dr. Fong will present his research in two segments. We will have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Fong, thank you for presenting for us today. Please take it away. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Good afternoon or good morning. Thanks everyone for tuning in and thank Xi for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Bo Feng and I am with the American Institutes for Research. I appreciate TOPS for accepting this study and the opportunity to share with everyone our findings at this forum. The study team is interdisciplinary, and most of my co-authors are online, and Mike and Rahi will help answer your questions through the chat function while I talk. Very short description of me. I graduated in public policy at Georgia State in 2018, and I am a applied health economist by trade. I joined a research firm since graduation, and the company is now part of AIR starting this year. On my two main work streams at AIR, I provide operational and implementation support to the advanced alternative payment models established by the Innovation Center within CMS. I work closely with Medicare fee-for-service claims data on a daily basis. I also develop tests, validate, as well as evaluate healthcare quality measures for the various CMS payment and quality programs, such as the hospital inpatient quality reporting program. There, I work with data from the electronic health records to develop electronic clinical quality measures for CMS. Outside of work, I continue to collaborate with others on research projects. Let me just briefly pause here to display the disclaimer. Um, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that my involvement in the study is independent of the grant. We initiated the work while I was at GSU and Dr. Pasco is one of my committee members. Second, what I'm presenting today does not necessarily represent the official view of the NIH and does not represent the views of AIR. Let me start with three high-level points about the study, what motivated our topic, and what is the key variable that we are investigating, and what data we used for the analysis. So first, pregnant women who smoke cigarettes and are motivated to quit smoking may find electronic cigarettes or e-cigarettes as an alternative tool for smoking sensation for many reasons, 
One reason could be that health providers are reluctant to recommend nicotine replacement therapy. Another reason could be that randomized clinical trials have shown that e-cigarettes can be more effective than NRTs for smoking cessation, and they found that information online. At a broader level, e-cigarettes have radically changed the U.S. tobacco market and have drawn attention from media, the research community, and among policymakers. We are seeing a growing number of legalities that levies a tax on these products. Then a natural question then came up was, how will the e-cigarette taxes impact pre-pregnancy and prenatal smoking, vaping, as well as birth outcomes? While the variable of interest appears easy to analyze, how to measure it is actually kind of tricky. Unlike taxes on the traditional cigarettes that are levied as a fixed amount per pack, e-cig taxes are unit specific. Some localities levy a fixed tax amount per fluid milliliter, while others levy the air of Lauren taxes or levy the sales tax. So given that very scheme as a taxation was kind of challenging to understand the relative magnitude of e-cigarette taxes across place. But we are gonna take advantage of a recently published study that used a novel approach to converting these different e-cig taxes to a common format to examine the questions that we are interested in. And I'll provide you with, with a bit more details about that standardization approach later. So naturally, for the questions we're interested in, we went to the restricted version of the birth records data that provide the universe of births in this country and various other data sets. Our key outcome variables from the birth records data are pre-pregnancy smoking, prenatal smoking, and different birth outcome indicators. Again, let me give you a bit more information on how we constructed the analysis sample and each of those outcome variables in later slides. Just a quick note, we are still revising this study given the feedback we have collected. And the results I'm presenting today, although they're new compared to those in the working paper, they can be updated later, but we'll surely update the paper and post the paper on the public domain once it's ready. Let me lay out the simple version of our thought processes and preview what we found. By the law of demand, making e-cigarettes more costly to get, in this case, but levying a tax on them can lead to a reduced consumption of the product. If traditional cigarettes and e-cigarettes are economic substitutes to pregnant women, then we would expect a rise in cigarette smoking when e-cigarettes become more costly. If they're complements, however, the consumption of both products can go down together. In terms of how e-cigarette taxes are linked to birth outcomes, well, if consumption of both products went down, then we could expect better birth outcomes given the evidence we've known so far. But if one goes up while the other goes down, then we really don't know how the change in birth outcomes on that would be since nicotine is still harmful for pregnant women and the fetus. Overall, we found that higher e-cigarette tax rates led to reduced vaping, but more cigarette smoking during both pre-pregnancy and pregnancy. We didn't find much evidence of e-cigarette taxes on birth outcomes, but that doesn't mean that there's no evidence at all. We thought the limited contemporaneous effect of e-cig taxes on birth outcomes can be due to many reasons. One, it could be that nicotine is still harmful for fetal development, regardless of the source. Or it could be that our tax impacts on cigarette smoking are still small. Or three, it could be also that the harm of increased prenatal smoking on births manifest later in life. Slightly different from the traditional talk, let me experiment a new approach. And that approach is I will put equal weight on how we constructed the analysis sample, the outcome variables, and performed the data merge between external data sources and the birth records data. Running regressions and generating results are no doubt important, but I think building all these primitives is equally, if not more important. So my goal is that by going through all those details, one, I show transparency, two, you have a clear grasp of the empirical approaches we took, not just our modeling approach, but equally important, our data cleaning approach. And three, our results can be replicable if you have full data access. If I'm running out of time, as I have prepared more slides than the time allocated and couldn't finish the results section, I think that'll be fine. 
For some slides, I'll go rather quickly, while for others, I'll spend a bit more time. I'll surely skip slides due to time constraints, but for completeness, I included the slides for your reference. The slides will be available for download and our paper will be on the public domain. So please feel free to check out the paper. And importantly, I think once you have a clear picture of how each of these data elements was cleaned and coded, you will find it much easier to digest the paper as well as the results. Perhaps not surprising to us, the intricate relationship between traditional cigarettes and e-cigarettes has presented a challenge to policymakers. On the one hand, restricting access to e-cigarettes will help reduce nicotine consumption. But on the other hand, such actions may disturb smoking sensation efforts for those who are genuinely using e-cigarettes as an aid. Over time, states and localities have taken various steps to regulate these products. To oversimplify a bit, we see that during the early stage, policy decisions slash efforts had focused on youth access. Then the next wave of policy started to ban vaping in different places. And more recently, policy efforts have turned to taxation, and that is the interest of our study. Smoking during pregnancy is absolutely risky and harmful, both for the mom and the fetus. Hence, smoking during pregnancy is stigmatized and is strongly discouraged. Vaping during pregnancy is also discouraged, but like cigarette smoking, vaping does occur. Nicotine consumption during pregnancy is linked to various adverse health effects, not only for the mom, but also for the baby, as well as later childhood development. For example, several published studies have shown that cigarette use during pregnancy can lead to low birth weight, preterm birth, and a human capital development for the child. However, for pregnant moms who smoke cigarettes and are motivated to quit smoking may turn to e-cigarettes for help if they perceive e-cigarettes as less harmful and if they believe that the products can help them quit smoking before birth. There are studies asking pregnant moms' perception of e-cigarettes and whether they could help them quit smoking, but a larger literature review has suggested that vaping while pregnant can cause similar harms to the fetus as does smoking. The health effects of vaping over smoking during pregnancy are not really clear, but of course, vaping during pregnancy is worse than not using any nicotine products at all. So we think it will be kind of interesting to see empirically whether e-cigarette taxes have any effects on birth outcomes. For the sake of time, let me just very quickly touch upon a few studies in this sphere. And what I say and cover in the slide does not do justice to these studies. First, there is some research on the effects of e-cigarette policies on pre-pregnancy and prenatal smoking, as well as birth outcomes. For the ones that have looked into the various policies, they generally found that ESIC policies reduced smoking sensation for pregnant women. One study in particular that also used the birth records data found that indoor vaping laws have led to increased infant mortality. Extracting from pregnant women, there are studies that focused on e-cigarette taxes and they have generally suggested that traditional cigarettes and e-cigarettes are economic substitutes. Let's start talking about the data we used in this study. So to investigate the questions we are interested in, we turn to the administrative birth records data with the geocode information on the mom's county of residence, when the birth occurred, and how long did the pregnancy last. So first accessing the data requires a DUA and the restricted data are stored in a secure environment. At the time we began the study, we only had the data till the end of 2017. But now we have included into the analysis data from 2018, from 19, as well as the newly available 2020 data. The birth records data in the early years didn't really have the key information that we need until they wrote out the revised birth record form in 2003. But states' adoption of this form varied in time and scale. Some used it early on, while others used it pretty late. But by the end of 2015, virtually every state has begun using this form. And we like to acknowledge that smoking information is self-reported, even though the birth records themselves are considered administrative data. 
So how we build the analysis sample from the raw data? First of all, given that taxation on e-cigarettes really started since the second half of 2015, we thought maybe that could be one of the reasons to not stretch the baseline period too much. So for the main analysis, we started the sample in January 2013, defined by conception year and month. For those who are familiar with the birth records data or you have worked with it in the past, you'll notice that the data really only give you information on birth delivery, and there's no column in the data that says mom's pregnancy date. So our first step is to estimate when did the pregnancy start. For this exercise, we drew on three critical pieces of information that is existing in the data and a few assumptions. First, the three key variables we need are the year when the birth occurred, the month, as well as the gestational length, which is measured in weeks. Unfortunately, there's no information in the data that tells me the day of the birth. We then used the following assumptions to estimate every mom's conception time. And for the sake of time, I'll skip those assumptions, but they're here for your reference. Just a quick note that to calculate the conception time, we assume the birth month means the end of the month, and the gestational length means the start of the week. Again, we started the sample in January 2013, defined by conception year and month. To maintain symmetry, we used conception year and month to select the endpoint of the main analysis sample, and we used December 2019. Note that we caught the sample by December 2019 based on conception time and not based on delivery time. So births in 2020 with conception in 2019 are included. We then applied a series of data exclusions and data inclusions. For example, we removed birth in three states due to their low use rate of the revised birth form by 2013. One thing to note is that we retained, however, moms with missing information on their demographics. The birth records data really don't have many of those missing cases. And we coded that missing information as an independent category and we controlled for them in the models. So after all these data cleaning steps, our analysis sample arrived at roughly 25 million records. There are three other analysis samples that we used in this study. The first one is the infant mortality data between 2013 and 18. Usually these data lag the birth records data by one year, but the last time we checked, CDC has not yet released 2019 mortality data. In one part of our analysis, we reshaped the raw birth records data differently so that we can use a different modeling approach. And I'll show you how we did that transformation in later slides. It was a very simple data reshape exercise. Birth records data do not have vaping information. So to get a sense of the so-called first stage effect, and that is whether e-cigarette taxes had an effect on e-cigarette use, we turn to the PRANS data and we use 2016 to 18. 18 was the latest data at the time of our analysis. And 16 was because that was the first year questions on e-cigarette use were introduced. And let me quickly talk about our outcome variables and how we constructed them. And then I will pause and take some clarifying questions. For cigarette and e-cigarette consumption related variables, we focus on the following. Any prenatal smoking, average number of cigarettes smoked per day during pregnancy, the number of trimesters moms reported smoking cigarettes and in pre-pregnancy smoking. And lastly, those two variables are not within the birth records data, but they're from the PRANS data. All these variables are constructed in a very standard format. Let me just note that the number of trimesters moms reported smoking cigarettes, though strictly speaking, that is a categorical variable. We treated it as if it were continuous. And the reason is that using nonlinear models like the ordinal logistic regression, we encounter non-convergence issues. For the birth outcome related variables, here are the ones we created within the birth records data and the infant mortality data. And most of them are self-explanatory. And for the interest of time, let me just focus on the two that are a bit less straightforward and they are the small for gestational age and the extra small for gestational age. So the difference between those two variables is basically the cutoff point we used. And we created both variables by pairing information 
of gestational length and birth weight. So for the first one, here's how we coded it. For a given gestational length, if the birth weight is in the first quartile of that weight distribution, we set it equal to one and zero otherwise. And for the second one, we set it equal to one if the birth weight is in the first decile of that weight distribution of a given gestational length. And lastly, is the indicator for whether or not the baby has died in the same year of birth. And for this variable, we used the infant mortality data. A quick note about this variable, the mortality data only record same year death and not death in subsequent years. However, they capture about 88% of infant death. So these are the outcome variables that we examined. And let me briefly pause here um, before moving to the standardized e-cigarette taxes. Thank you, Bo. Great. So let's see why they're all discussing today. Justin White um, has any questions and comments. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, just a, a couple uh, questions at this stage. So one is just a quick question about your sample construction. You mentioned that you're dropping uh, a few states that I, I think maybe didn't adopt the new birth record form uh, in time. You mentioned Connecticut and uh, New Jersey and maybe one or two others. I was curious about, it, it does seem like there's still a substantial amount of pre-tax data from those states um, and whether you, you had also done uh, sensitivity analyses that include those uh, states and sort of, it, could you explain a little bit more why they were dropped? Yeah, thanks Justin, thanks for the question. So first, uh, the primary reason why they were dropped is because the extent to which the statewide use of that revised form is very low. The rate is very low because that form allows us to estimate the key variables, which is pre-pregnant smoking and prenatal smoking. That's one determining factor. And the second is, yes, we conducted additional sensitivity analysis by extending the starting period of the sample from 2013 to 2011. And we also showed that results in the paper, although I have not yet included them in the slides, but that they're definitely in the paper. Okay, yeah, great. thank you. And so uh, let me let me also ask about your outcome measures. Um, I, I'm wondering, you, you mentioned that they're all self-reported for smoking, um, which you know is a, not, you know, just a natural limitation of the data set, but should we worry that number of cigarettes per day is more likely to be mismeasured in, in this data set than smoking status? And what I have in mind is particularly that it's known that there's a lot of within-person fluctuation in smoking during pregnancy as you know, these women are, are often trying repeatedly to quit or cut down. And so they're reporting like, you know, their average over the course of a three month period when there's a lot of uh, fluctuation um, and might make it hard to, to self-report that number. And, and I know that economists would typically, you know, take the view that mismeasurement of an outcome measure is gonna reduce precision, but maybe not bias. Um, but that does also rely on the fact that, you know, maybe this is an uninformative uh, mismeasurement, uh, but it's also the case that, you know, mismeasurement of smoking status in the birth records is, is associated with certain characteristics of pregnant women, like more educated women, et cetera. And so I, I'm wondering, you know, what, what your thoughts are on that. And, and yeah, you know, focusing on, on smoking intensity versus, uh, or including smoking intensity as opposed to just focusing on smoking status. Absolutely, yeah, thanks very much. I think there are three major pieces, components within your question. The first one is about uh, self-reported. That's the nature of this variable. We actually did investigate the extent to which just by regressing the missing of reporting smoking as the outcome variable to see whether or not the tax had an impact on the extent to which they report or they do not report. And we include that analysis in the uh, latest results. The second is, what about the characteristics, for example, whether or not the extent to which some women with a particular characteristics are more likely to report compared to others with a different characteristics. We also looked into that by looking at the composition, meaning that the extent to which, for example, low educated uh, pregnant women are more likely to report. And we also looked into that. We analyzed that in the paper. And number three, I think, is about the different outcome variables. That is right, in addition to the participation, basically whether or not the reported smoking, we also looked into the extent to which, for example, the average number of cigarettes they smoked 
And we typically don't analyze the conditional on positive outcomes, but I'm gonna show some results in later slides and how they look. Okay, well, one more quick question. Just, uh, do you also estimate uh, results by trimester? I, I know you mentioned you, you look at sort of this uh, cumulative number of um, trimesters, but, but I'm curious just because of my expectation, this is not my area of expertise, but I, I would imagine that nicotine's effects on fetal development would sort of depend on that timing of um, uh, exposure. Well, I think in the latest results, of, of course, we are still telling our results we looked into a particular number of cigarettes pregnant women smoked in a given trimester. Yeah, definitely those results will be in the paper once it's published on the domain, public domain. Thanks. That's it for yeah. now. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the questions, uh, Q Q and A are cleared. So please continue with your presentation, Bob. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thanks a lot. So let's start talking about uh, e-cigarette taxes. Uh, by the end of 2020, there are about 30 localities that have levied a tax on these products. And if you recall, the way these products are taxed is not homogeneous across place. Some places set the tax based upon the fluid per milliliter, while others use the Florin tax or sales tax. So overall, the most commonly used is the fixed tax amount per fluid. And that is the format the standardized e-cigarette tax rates were constructed. This paper published by the Tobacco Control used a novel approach to normalize e-cigarette taxes with the different forms. And Mike, who is online, is one of the authors of that paper. Before I talk about how they did it at a very high level, I'd just like to emphasize that they made these data publicly available, and I think that is really nice for the research community. So how the standardization worked? First, the key data set they used for the conversion for the exercise was the Nielsen retail scanner data. Then they took the quantity of e-cigarette sales, the product revenue, along with the product characteristics for every UPC they find in the data to calculate one of the three key elements for the conversion. Using the Ed Lauren tax as an example, here are the three primitives in this conversion. The first is codified tax changes. And in this case is the percentage attached to the wholesale price. The second is the wholesale price. And the third is a estimated markup used by a typical retailer. So the first component is basically public information, but the second and third are not. So they first estimated the wholesale price per fluid milliliter in a single year to reduce the influence of other time varying factors. And they picked 2013, as that was the very first year Nielsen data started to categorize e cigarette products. They then used the data points only from those localities that have not adopted e-cigarette taxes by 2020 and calculated the sales weighted average retail price per fluid. Then to convert the retail price back to the wholesale price, they assumed a 35% markup rate based on their systematic review of a company purchasing form. And the resulted average retail price is simply the product of the three. Note that this average retail price per fluid milliliter is at the county year and quarter level. And those are what those small letters represent. Analogously, to convert the sales tax and the per container tax to the tax per fluid milliliter, they went through a similar process. In the end, all these data set is at the county year and quarter level. And that is what we used for the data merge. Uh, one important note, the time dimension we used was mom's conception year and conception quarter, and not birth year and birth quarter because we're interested in how e-cigarette tax rates affected prenatal smoking. This simple graph gives you a sense of how the population weighted national average e-cigarette taxes compared to the total cigarette taxes over time. Two quick points from the graph. First, it's pretty obvious that the magnitude of e-cigarette taxes is dwarfed by that of secret taxes. And second, the weighted average e-secret taxes are consistently lower than a dollar. And keep that in mind when we see the estimate coefficient of e-secret tax rates in later slides, because that will help us interpret the tax impact. 
This graph shows you the number of tax changes due to regulatory actions over our study period. On average, there were about four per year. And in 2019, regulatory actions were fairly active. And the map shows you where all the localities that levy the tax on these products. The darker the color, the more recent they implemented the tax. And the gray area indicates either they have not yet adopted BC tax or their tax went into effect after the end point of our analysis sample. So the simple message from the map is that there isn't a strong geoglossary of localities that levied ESIC taxes. For the interest of time, I will skip this slide about the other policy controls we included in the regression. If you're interested in what each of these variables measures, what is the level of their variation, and what is the source for them, the slides are here for your reference. For the demographic variables, we control the following in the regression, and all of these variables are controlled in the most flexible manner. As I noted previously, there were a few missing values for these variables, and we did not throw them away, but controlled them as a separate, independent category in the model. We use linear models to examine the impact of e cigarette tax rates on all the outcome variables, and the model specification is straightforward. We have all demographic variables and all policy variables controlled for in the regression. As a reminder, in the birth records data, each row denotes a birth for a woman who resides in a given state, county, year, and month. So our outcome variables and all the demographic variables are at this level. But the key regressor, the inflation adjusted standardized e-cigarette tax rate is at the county, year, and quarter level. And we merged or joined these two data sets based upon mom's county of residence, year of conception, and a quarter of conception. And if you recall that for every birth, we estimated the mom's pregnancy year, month, of course, quarter. Some policy variables are at the same level as the standardized e tax rates of county year and quarter, but others are only at the state year and quarter. In terms of the fixed effects, so first the fixed effects are basically dummy variables. And we use the county fixed effects, time fixed effects, which we define as the interaction of conception year and conception month. So January 2015 and the February 2015 are two separate categories we included in the regression. And lastly, we used the categories formed by the state and year interaction. The state is mom's state of residence, and a year is conception year. So for example, Maryland 2015 and Maryland 2016 are two separate categories included in the model. So what did each of these fixed effects do? So first, the county fixed effects allow us to focus on changes in e-cigarette tax rates that occur within a particular county and over time. So they help to remove any time invariant unobservables that are county specific, but somehow are potentially correlated with both our regressor and our outcome variables. Second, the time fixed effects help to remove any secular changes that are common across the board. Third, the state by year fixed effects help to further isolate e-cigarette tax changes that are happening for a given state within a given year from other contemporaneous factors that are somehow unobserved to us, but they're invariant for a given state within a given year and correlated with our key regressor. Just to note that for the states that implemented e-cigarette taxes on first state of a given year, these set of group dummies will essentially absorb all the key variation in the e-cigarette tax rates, of course, except for changes due to inflation adjustments. Lastly, we clustered the standard errors at the level where our key regressor varies. If you recall, we did some simple data transformation on the raw birth records data, so we can use a different modeling approach. And here shows how we did it. On the left, you see a mock birth with four additional columns, each of which denotes a smoking status in a particular point in time. Then the data reshape simply converted that wide format to the long format. And now each row is no longer a birth, but a birth trimester combination. 
So in the panel analysis, we used the birth fixed effects and the trimester fixed effects. We then merged the e-cigarette tax data into this reshaped data set based upon mom's county of residence and a year of trimester for each of those four points and a quarter of trimester again for each of those four points. And now you see why there's no need for the mom's demographic information. Some simple summary statistics in visuals and this graph shows us a couple of things. First, it shows us the percentage of moms who reported smoking cigarettes during pre-pregnancy and the percentage of them smoking cigarettes during pregnancy. Blue colors indicate pre-pregnancy smoking and orange ones indicate prenatal smoking. Second, we showed that percentage overall. We also showed that percentage broken down by whether or not localities have adopted e-cigarette taxes by the end of our study uh, sample. Third, we see that the orange bars are consistently lower than the blue bars, which isn't surprising because smoking declines monotonically as birth nears. Fourth, we see that the relative drop in smoking is a little bit higher among tax adopters than that among non-tax adopters. One may be eager to do another comparison and think that, well, if smoking decreases as birth nears, and it decreases a bit faster in tax adopting localities, the non-tax adopting localities, they may be letting a tax on e-cigarettes help to discourage prenatal smoking even more. While this comparison seems intuitive, it is misleading. Instead of percentage of smoking, uh, this one focuses on the average number of cigarettes smoked per day during pre-pregnancy and during pregnancy. And for the sake of time, I will skip this one, but they're here for your reference. Similarly, we see a larger decrease in relative terms among the tax adopters. This one further breaks down the average number of cigarettes smoked on a typical day by trimester. Again, now for the interest of time, let me skip it. They're here for the reference. Again, similar story descriptively to what we saw in previous graphs. Before showing if e-cigarette taxes truly led to decreased prenatal and pre-pregnancy smoking as suggested by these summary graphs, let me share with you the first stage effect, and that is whether or not e-cigarette taxes affected vaping for pregnant women. For this exercise, we used the PRAMS data in years 2016 to 18. And there we did see that higher e-cigarette tax rates reduced the probability of moms using e-cigarettes both during pre-pregnancy and in the third trimester. So the first stage effect appears to be there and they hope to support any effect, either positive or negative, we could find what we may find from e-cigarette taxes, um, pre-pregnancy and prenatal smoking. The vertical dotted line indicates 95 confidence interval. Now, let me move on to our key outcome variables and the birth records data analysis. This graph is a, little, a bit more congested, so let me break it down for you. First, there are three different shapes, and each shape represents a beta coefficient from a different regression where the full set of controls is in the model. Green circles means the outcome variable is any pre-pregnancy smoking. Orange triangle means any prenatal smoking. And the purple square means the number of trimesters moms reported smoking cigarettes. So unlike the summary graphs, which I saw using the quasi-experimental research design, we see the higher e-cigarette tax rate led to more pre-pregnancy smoking and prenatal smoking. Using the triangle as the example, the beta coefficient means that holding everything else constant, a $1 increase in the standardized e cig tax rate is associated with 0.4 percentage point increase in the probability of prenatal smoking. Dividing that beta coefficient by the average proportion of moms reporting prenatal smoking among the tax adopters and before their tax went into effect, we had the relative impact of the tax, and which is about 5.6%. So we know that smoking decreases gradually as birth nears. Using research design, we found that higher e-cigarette tax rate did not expedite the decrease, but actually slowed that decrease. By comparing the magnitude of the tax effect on pre-pregnancy smoking and prenatal smoking, 
we see the effect is slightly larger on the former, which is the green circle. And that suggests that the increased prenatal smoking due to higher e-cigarette taxes could be partly due to that moms smoked more cigarettes before they become pregnant. And that increased smoking carried through the pregnancy. So higher prenatal smoking due to higher e taxes is not likely to be solely happening during pregnancy. Here we show the e tax effect on the average number of cigarettes moms reported smoking on a typical day during pregnancy. Uh, for reference, we also show the tax effect on the average number of cigarettes moms smoked, conditioning on they smoked cigarettes at least once in that period. Typically, we don't examine the tax effect on conditional outcome when the condition is based on the outcome variable itself, because we're worried about the compositional change induced by such conditioning. Uh, even if changing easy taxes is a pure coin flip, we still have that concern. So I won't pay too much attention to these slides, but they're here for your reference. Let me focus on the green circle, which indicates the average number of cigarettes moms reported smoking during pregnancy. And if we compare the relative impact of e taxes here to that on the probability of smoking during pregnancy, we see that the tax effect lies mostly on participation. And that is higher taxes have a larger impact on whether or not moms reported smoking cigarettes than the number of cigarettes they smoked. As a standard, we used the event study style regression to decompose the weighted average e tax effect into two parts. The first part tells us whether there is any anticipatory effect of e tax implementation on a particular outcome, or to pull it differently, whether the decision to levy a tax on e-cigarettes is attributable to, say, higher cigarette smoking. They can also provide a support to the common trends assumption, which is a core assumption underlying the typical difference in differences set up. The second part tells me the dynamics of e tax effects on the outcome variable, and that is whether the tax effect is more salient in the period immediately following the policy action or its impact accumulates over time. Each point indicates an estimated beta coefficient for that particular indicator, and a given indicator denotes whether the mom's pregnancy is before or after the implementation of ESIC taxes. If it is before, how long it preceded the tax implementation day, and if it is after, how long the tax effective day has passed. And these indicators are mutually exclusive, but collectively exhaustive. The hollow shape indicates the reference group. So using the hollow green circle on the left, that indicator means mom's pregnancy date preceded the e-cigarette tax effective day by at least nine months, but no more than 12 months. And we picked that indicator as the reference group because the implementation of e-cig taxes is likely to not overlap with any period during that mom's pregnancy, tax can be in effect after the birth. So quick points about these graphs. First, we see little anticipatory tax effects indicated by the circles or triangles before the reference group. As you see there, the beta coefficients are fairly close to zero. Second, we see that the tax effects are larger in periods that are away from the point of birth rather than close to birth. And that suggests that the e tax effect escalates with time. This graph focuses on the average number of cigarettes smoked during pregnancy. Again, we see a similar pattern to the previous graph. One, there is no strong evidence for anticipatory effect. And two, tax effects on the number of cigarettes smoked during pregnancy escalates with time. We also looked at the heterogeneity in e taxes the impact on different subpopulations of interest for the outcome variables we looked at. And for the interest of time, I'll skip these graphs, but again, they are here for your reference. We looked at how e tax rates are linked to various birth outcomes. And in this graph, you see that we found very little impact on these birth outcomes, but the higher e taxes but to more prenatal smoking. There are more tasks we did, but I think the time allocated for uh, presentation is running almost over. So uh, some of these tasks are included in the slides we reference, but the whole set of tests we did, as well as their results, 
are in the paper. So let me quickly summarize what we did and what we found. We examined if higher e cig tax rates had any impact on pre-pregnancy and prenatal vaping and smoking. If so, what were their impacts? We also studied whether higher taxes affected birth outcomes. Using birth records data and other data sets across many years, we found that higher e cig taxes led to lower vaping, but more cigarette smoking, both during pre-pregnancy and pregnancy. Combining with our first age effect, our findings suggest that for every three moms who didn't use e-cigarettes due to higher taxes, one of them used cigarettes instead. We didn't find much evidence for the adverse effect of e-cigarette taxes on birth outcomes. So what do our findings mean? So first, our results show that increased prenatal smoking attributable to higher e-cigarette taxes is unlikely to be solely during that period. Instead, higher smoking is partly carried over from moms smoking more cigarettes before they become pregnant. Although we didn't explicitly examine this, such carryover could persist after the birth. And if so, the increased prenatal smoking not only harms moms during pregnancy, it can also have negative impacts on childhood development. We found very little evidence on the impact of e cig taxes on birth outcomes in the study, but we know that there are many studies that have shown that increased prenatal smoking can cause a lot of harms to the second generation. So for example, one stream of research is showing that in utero exposure to cigarette smoke can adversely impact brain development and impair early health and human capital development for the child. The product of e-cigarettes continues to change and e-cigarettes continue to alter the tobacco marketplace. How to deal with these e-cigarettes remains an active policy debate and any e-cigarette related policy will surely be an active research topic. Let me stop here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, let's turn to our discussion today, Justin, first to see if he has any questions. Thank you, yeah. Um, I, I would just say, uh, start with the comment that I, I think this is a really important study <clears throat> and a nice uh, addition to the older literature that you referred to that looks at the effects of cigarette taxes. And I think it's really important to understand um, the more you know, recent tax changes um, passing these e-cigarette taxes and what their effects are. So I commend you on, on uh, you know, a really nice study. Um, the result that I think really jumped out at me uh, most was probably from your PRAMS analysis showing that uh, e-cigarette taxes resulted in a decline of 80 in, in vaping during the third trimester of 82%, which is just, you know, a very large effect. And so I'm wondering what, what you make of that um, estimate. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Justin, for your comment. Uh, so I have questions. First of all, we are updating, I think, the 2019 data from the PRAMS are available and we're trying to incorporate the data to see by adding one year of data whether or not that magnitude can vary. And number two is, I think it's a bit, on the one hand, um, interesting to see that strong first stage effect. On the other hand, I think, you know, we have to be cognizant that it's a $1 change in the standardized e-secret tax rates. And we see that graph consistently the e-cigarette tax rate is below a dollar. So that is a strong change in the tax itself. So that's, I think, a linkage between the magnitude and how we interpret that coefficient here. So I'm also wondering something that didn't come up, but I, I'm curious about is what, if anything, do you see as implications for things like nicotine replacement therapy and other smoking cessation aids that are also substitutes for, for cigarettes? And uh, back in December, Nancy Rigotti gave a presentation for TOPS where she focused on, you know, the opportunity that hospitalization provides for intervening and providing smoking cessation interventions. And I think of pregnancy as somewhat similar that, you know, many women are very highly motivated at, uh, to quit smoking during pregnancy. And it's also a time when they're interacting quite regularly with the medical system, which isn't, you know, typically true. And so it seems like it's also a time when, you know, theoretically, uh, medical providers could be uh, pushing other sorts of interventions as well. Um, trials tend to find that 
NRT is not as effective as e-cigarettes versus smoking cessation, smoking cessation. But you know, I'd expect that NRT is you know maybe you could regulate the nicotine amount more using NRT right, rather than e-cigarettes, and that could be important for the health of the fetus. So, what, what do you make of the uh, the implications for these other potential substitutes? Yeah, those are good points. I haven't thought about that part yet. Let me see, Mike, do you have any um, feedback or comments? But those are really interesting points. Thanks, Justin. Sure. Well, uh, okay, we, so, something to think about. So, um, so something else I, I would ask is um, specific to your panel analysis. Um, so if I understand correctly, that analysis is just using variation in tax rates for women who had a tax that passed during their pregnancy. So, so is that sort of like before or after uh, variation? And because you have those birth fixed effects that you're including, I think that would assume that the e-cigarette taxes are being passed, uh, passed through very quickly. So that tax, e-cigarette e tax, sorry, e-cigarette prices would have to increase during the pregnancy in order for the woman to respond to that. Um, I know that Mike and Catherine have another paper showing that it, this can take time to happen. So what do you make of the sort of th that lag that's going to happen in terms of when uh, pass through is going to happen and whether, you know, wh whether we should expect anything from that analysis? Right. Yeah, that's a, those are good points. So first of all, the e-cigarette tax rates and not just the implementation of whether or not e-cig tax went into effect, those will be the key variation we got to use to see the impact, if any, of the e-cigarette tax rates using the birth fixed effects on the outcome variables. And number two is, uh, it's for most states, most localities, the taxes rises gradually, but some localities, they change their tax rates down or up and during that window. So we use that frequency to, of course, as the identified variation in the birth fixed effects model. Okay, thank you yeah. for clarifying. Um, what, one last question, if I may. Um, so it seems like th this situation you, where you have this staggered adoption of policy uh, of the e-cigarette taxes um, is sort of the, you know, the, that gets you into the world of variation in, in treatment timing, which is important for difference in differences models. And, you know, so this is sort of the standard question, but uh, about how, how you, you know, whether you have some uh, analyses where you, you've looked at alternative approaches. And I mentioned this specifically because it does appear that there's heterogeneity and sort of the, the timing of the treatment effects that it's sort of growing over time um, that your event studies showed. And so, uh, yeah, ha have, you, have you looked at, into these alternative approaches and whether that, that's gonna make a, a difference in your context? Yeah, thanks, Justin. Really nice comments. Uh, definitely, the literature is evolving rapidly in the DD area. So we conducted at least two analyses to get into that. Number one is the commonly used leap one out analysis. So we drop one treated area one at a time to see whether or not the tax impact is exclusively driven by one particular treatment area. Number two is we apply the Bacon decomposition, the, sorry, the Goodman decomposition to see whether or not that kind of concern is severe within the data within the number of treated units, as well as the number of control units we have in the birth records data. And we showed that in the paper. And I, I can um, answer just in your question about the nicotine replacement therapy and, and if our um, study has any implications for um, uh, uh, for that product. Um, I, th I think that, you know, there, there is, our, our study does suggest that there is demand among pregnant women for smoking cessation uh, assistance, right? Um, and I think that they might uh, confront kind of a, a you know, medical system that's um, kind of uh, divided on whether um, smoking cessation interventions like nicotine replacement therapy, a pharmacotherapy is appropriate or not, right? Um, and I think that you know, the United States Preventative Task Force that gives it incomplete evidence on if this is appropriate or not, whereas you know, the Affordable Care Act, they do require insurance to cover it, right? So I think that there's, it's a little bit inconsistent kind of the uh, the evidence base and if this should be used. Um, 
And I do think it does kind of demonstrate that it would be good for more research kind of in this space of the, the benefits that nicotine replacement therapy has for pregnant women, because there clearly is a demand for something, right? And if women aren't um, going to receive nicotine gum or, or, or a patch um, or other pharmacotherapy aid, um, they might be more likely to try using uh, an e-cigarette than to help with their smoking cessation during their pregnancy. Thank you. Uh, I think there are some open questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is about um, your data. So from your data, is it possible to see any demographics on which moms pick up smoking off regular cigarettes when quitting e-cigarettes? Does the literature support the idea that smoking during, during pregnancy is particularly harmful to some moms? Uh, any explanation as to why you were able to identify substitutions between regular e-cigarettes and e-cigarettes? as a result of tax. Right, thanks, I guess I can answer it and the mic can of course support. Yeah, the first part is the differential tax impact, if I understood the question correctly, across different subpopulations. And we analyzed that by cutting the sample differently to see whether or not the tax impact affected, for example, one part of the population more than the other. And we show their results in the paper. And second is, uh, I gotta see the question. Yeah, the second question is, does literature support the idea that smoking during pregnancy is particularly harmful to certain moms or some moms? So. I think the medical evidence suggested that the smoking in general is harmful overall. And I'm not particularly familiar with one stream saying that it's uh, more harmful than one subpopulation than the other. Mike, do you, do you know that? Yeah, I, we, can, we can come back with this question later. Uh, I think there is another question that's quite interesting here. So um, given that people seem to use cigarettes and e-cigarettes as substitutes, uh, in that case, would it be important to include cigarette tax as a control as well? or even the interaction between um, cigarette taxes and e-cigarette taxes, I believe, uh, is the question. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, let me clarify that. We did include the inflation adjusted total cigarette taxes. It's a linear combination of federal taxes, state, and some local taxes. And I uh, included a slide in the uh, deck for your reference about the source, the level of variation, as well as um, the how we control for it. In terms of adding an interaction term between cigarette taxes and e-cigarette taxes, we haven't done that. Um, generally, we don't add the interaction, but we can take another look to see whether or not that made any impact on the story we are saying. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, we have time for one last question. Uh, so this is from Lauren Lampert. Uh, have you studied the impact of increasing cigarette taxes and e-cigarette taxes co concurrently, would this diminish the substitution effect? Let's see, the impact of increasing SIG tax and e-cig tax concurrently. Um, in addition to control for SIG tax in the same model and to look at their partial effects at the same time, uh, can you be more specific? Um, Hello, that would be great, thank you. Yeah, um, one last question. I think this is very interesting. Um, is there any reason to believe that e-cigarette tax hacks are driven by pre-existing changes in attitudes or unobservables at either the local or state level? I think we see literature uh, regarding cigarette tax hacks. So do you have- Right, right. Yeah, I mean, one way we can investigate that empirically in the data is to use the event study and results you know, I demonstrated and they are in the slides to see whether or not that kind of anticipatory effect exists. And actually, we did not really find much evidence for that, saying that, you know, the decision to levy an easy tax is driven, for example, by the strong perception or the rising rates in cigarette smoking. And we really didn't find much for that. But it's always a concern, and we always examine that. Thank you very much. Well, about time. So uh, let's turn this to Dr. Eugene uh, Cho to wrap this up. Thank you very much both for the presentation. Oh, thanks everyone. Thank you for the time.
Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 245 people for your participation. Have a great weekend.